that he might man redeem. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. His name above all names shall stand, exalted more and more. At God the Father's own right hand, where angel hosts adore. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. His name shall be the Counselor, the mighty Prince of Peace, of all earth's kingdoms conquer, whose reign shall never cease. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. And so glad you're here uh, this morning. Excited to see what the Lord's going to do. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we sure do love you. We thank you for the day. We thank you for the opportunity to come to church this morning. Lord, we ask that you'd be uh, magnified through song and through preaching and through fellowshipping. We sure do need you in your son's name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. All right. Turn me to number 391. And if you want to put your finger in 237, we'll go there last, but 391 for now. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one, he is the just one, he hath the words of life. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what he saith, do what he willeth, he is the living way. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter in. I will hasten to hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to you're here. Hey, and, uh, if you're a visitor today and have not received a visitor card, our men in the back, and they would love to give you one. And uh, so if you've not received one, just raise your hand. We'll not embarrass you, but we'd love to give you a visitor card. And uh, we got some over here. Uh, we want to get that. That way you can uh, turn it in in the back after the service for a uh, gift, um, a coffee mug for you to remember spot and so we can have a record of your visit. I, I, I slipped up and said coffee mug. I meant to say I, I should have said tea mug. So 
Um, for you coffee drinkers, that was for you today. And uh, glad you're here. There's some more visitors here. Hey, and um, and if, we, if we've missed you, just raise your hand. We'll, we'll get you taken care of and we'll get you a, a visitor card. Hey, and uh, good to have Sean and Bridget in uh, this weekend. Glad that they're here uh, visiting us. Uh, excited what the Lord's doing in their life, okay? Oh, we're so glad you're here. <coughs> excited what the Lord's going to do. Number 237. We're singing on that first verse and have a time of fellowship with one another. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for 
such a worm as I At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light And the burden of my heart rolled away It was there by faith I received my sight And now I am happy all the day Go ahead and shake hands on that second verse was it for crimes that I have done he groaned upon the tree amazing pity grace unknown and love beyond degree at the cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all on the third well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in 
When Christ the mighty maker died For man the creature sin Sing it out! At the cross, at the cross Where I first saw the light The burden of my heart rolled away It was there by faith I received my sight And now I am happy all the day But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Amen. Great singing in Luke chapter 9 this morning, Luke chapter 9. And I do want to echo what Brother Bussy said. Thank you so much, visitors, for being here. Great to have you all. And also, it's a yearly tradition out here, but Mr. Scott, Brother Buddy's father, birthday boy, 83 years old. When you get to be a certain age, you're proud of it. Amen. And uh, my dad is 81, and he and my mom drove down to see Brother Nick this week. And they uh, FaceTimed me and texted me. All day Thursday and Friday, kept getting lost. And that dad never got lost before. And I think they added three hours another trip, but they finally made it down there, and they're going to a liberal church this Sunday. So pray for them. They're, not, they're, not, they're, they're used to hard preaching and all good preaching, but they're going to have to have a rough day with Brother Nick preaching all day. But no, they're down there in Texas where the weather's the same as it is here, praise God. Amen. My brother usually rubs it in. I'm like, it's the same right now. So happy birthday, brother, Mr. Scott. And buddy, it's so good to see you and your family out as always. Appreciate you being here today. And then Sean and Bridget, Brother Bussy, already mentioned them, and they're good to have them here. I preached them when they were teenagers. Now they're married. they got plans for having twin, 12 kids, and they're just real excited about their future and, and all that good stuff. So, amen. Luke 9, Luke 9, verse 49. Luke, 4, Luke chapter 9, verse 49. The Bible says this. And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him, because he followeth not with us. Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. You may be seated, and at this time we have a special, and I believe someone is signing for the special today. So that'll be a blessing. Sandy Street's going to be signing it. That's exciting. Great song choir. Appreciate that so much. And this time we'll have our special thing. I believe that you are God alone But sometimes I still try to take control Cause I get scared when I can't see the end And all you want from me is to let go You're parting waters Making a way for me You're moving mountains That I don't even see You've answered my prayer Before I even speak All you need for me to be Is still I bring my praise before I bring my need there's no fear you've not already seen I rest my heart on all your promises cuz I have seen and know your faithfulness your parting waters making a way for me your moving mountains that I don't even see my prayer before I even speak all you need for me to be is still and know that you are God be still and know that you trust that you are parting one 
waters. You whispered my name. You've answered my prayer. You're moving mountains. You're parting waters, making a way for me. You're moving mountains that I don't even see. You've answered my prayer before I even speak. All you need for me to be is still. Be still. Amen. I saw two real good dad jokes this morning I thought were worth sharing. Who likes dad jokes? Dad should raise your hand, amen. Be careful about educating a wolf because the wolf will become a werewolf. Some of you will catch that by slow freight. Some of you did not get that. See, that's the part about said dad jokes. Sometimes they're so deep you don't even get them. How about this one? If you never finish anything, are you a master at partial arts? All right, anyway. All right, Luke chapter 9, if I will be this morning. Man, some of y'all still didn't get that werewolf one. Did you get it, Briella? Okay, all right. She's just going to nod her head yes, because at lunch today, that'll be discussion. Well, he's talking about these little things. I was thinking about some of these things, because we're going to use a little education again uh, to help us. And I always like to do this when I travel and speak at camps and conferences. I try to find out what schools the teenagers go to. So in here, we'll talk about what schools you used to go to. Of course, some teens still go to school here, so we'll, they'll be able to participate in this. Interesting statistic I've kind of observed. I've taken kind of personal notes and observations over the last several years. 10, 12 years ago, the predominant crowd of teenagers I'd preach to at all the camps and conferences every summer would be mostly Christian school, public school, very small homeschool crowd. But over the last 8 to 10 years, it's amazing how big the homeschool crowd has grown in America. It's, it's, it's really amazing. And so how many of you are, how many of you were, were privileged to grow up and go to Christian school all your life? Would you raise your hand or still go to Christian school? All right. Raise your hand. That, that number's getting smaller now. Okay. How many of you were public school kids? Yeah. That's us. The hope of America. Amen. Government school, public school kids. And then how many of you homeschooled? Yeah, they usually cheer a little bit because they can start school whenever they want. They sleep in. They take snow days in May. I mean, it's awesome when you're a homeschool kid. And it works out real good for homeschool kids. But uh, I was a public school kid. And, and uh, of course, I actually was one of those jocks that did fairly well in school. I, I thought education was important. My mom and dad, of course, were educators, so they made it a big deal in our homes. But how many of you remember these kind of tests? Multiple choice tests where you had to fill in the dots, and you always had to remember the number two pencil? I don't even know if they still have that, man. I don't even know if you want to say that anymore nowadays just because, you know. But anyway, the number two pencil was awesome, man. And then they remember the mechanical pencils, man? Click, 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 and you write on there, and you break the lead, and you have to fill up the lead and all that stuff. But... But uh, I had some buddies that didn't care about school. And when they took tests like this picture you see up here on the screen, they would try to make pictures with them. You know, they tried, Brother George is confessing he's one of them. And they would, they would answer A, B, C, D, and then they'd be like, in the middle of the test, Diggy, what? Look, does that look like a clown to you? No, it doesn't, man. They don't even care about the grade, you know. And I had some buddies that, were, that actually would compete, and they were happy if one got a 59 and one got a 55. And he beat the 55, you know. You both failed, all right? You failed, you know. How many went to school with people like that? How many were that person in school? All right, Brother George, all right, I knew that. Brother Carl, too, okay. But, uh, but then there's those tests. Do we fill in the bubbles and all that with the number two pencils? And then there was those questions they would sneak in every once in a while where they would have an A answer, a B answer, a C answer, and then D would be either none of the above or all of the above. And in my experience of taking multiple tests of that, Usually, the all of the above and the none of the above were the correct choices to choose. All of the above especially, because here's what would happen sometimes, right? Okay, so let's go and get that first slide up, Brother Jason. You look at this, and it says, uh, what equals 10? Now, I just want you to know, I gave Brother Jason a simple mathematical, but he made sure to make it a little difficult by putting C in there. I just want you to know that. But if you look at this, this equation here, what equals 10? What, what, what are these three? So you look at A and you say, okay, 5 plus 5, does it equal 10, church? Yes. 2 plus 8, does it equal 10? 
Oh, wow. Now, usually when I took the test, if A and B both were right, I didn't care what C said. I went ahead and filled in none of the all of the above, right? Because you know it has to be all of the above. But for the sake of today, and to make sure Jason Miller gets a little shout out here, 90,428 minus 90,418, does that equal 10? How many struggled with that one? Be honest. How many struggled with that one a little bit? Because the numbers are so big, okay? So then obviously the answer is all of the above. Now, the goal as a Christian is this, okay? Christians have, have several purposes in life, and Brother John taught very well in Sunday school class last hour on Romans about how, how as Christians today, we, we, we are judged. If we judge, we are judged too, and we have to learn that balance there. But Christians are blessed. Salvation is a blessing. After salvation, there's multiple blessings. Not an easy life. You're not always going to have happy, glorious, wonderful days, but you will have a blessed life. There's no doubt. The presence of God brings blessings. Again, it's not easy, but the presence of God brings blessings, right? But what happens sometimes along the journeys, while the Christians are receiving blessings, they stop being a blessing. If we are the recipient of blessings, then we should also be a blessing. We should strive as Christians to be the best blessing we can possibly be. And the reason we have church still 2,000 years later, after this statement is made in our opening text where Jesus tells this statement to his disciples, John right there, especially John, and he says, hey, don't forbid him. If he's not against us, he's for us. The reason Jesus Christ was saying that is he's teaching the disciples, listen, we've got to understand that when it's all said and done, the Christian's job is not to just be one that receives blessings, but to be a blessing. So this week is Missions Jubilee Week. We have three unique fields coming represented. The deaf, New Zealand, and the Philippines. And I can personally testify that I know very, I'm very familiar with two of those three fields. I've never been to New Zealand, but I've been to Philippines, lived there for 12 days, and it changed my life. And I've grown up in the deaf world. And so here's what Christians do a lot of times. Don't miss this now. We are all about A. And we think because somebody would rather B that they're wrong. But 2 plus 8 equals the same thing as 5 plus 5 equals. Or we are all about B, but we're going to give someone a hard time because 90,428 minus 90,418 is the route they choose. You see, the answer has got to be the same. But the destination or the, or the method will sometimes change. And sometimes as Christians, we forget that just because we grew up a certain way or we've been taught certain things all our life, we begin to allow traditions, traditions to guide us over the Word of God. We allow an idea of a man, a charismatic leader, to begin to dictate to us over these things. And I'm telling you, when these, when these missionaries come in, they expose us to a different world and a different culture. And uh, unless you've traveled and been out of this country some, uh, you realize, you'll learn quickly that God is not an American. He's not an American. And I, I, it's hard, sometimes it's hard for me to say that, but it's the truth. God was God before America was ever founded, and God will still be God after America's gone. So what we do as Christians is we spend too much time on this slide when we should be more worried about the next slide. Go ahead, Brother Jason. Okay, now things are different. What equals 12? All right, church, help me out with this. A, 5 plus 7, is that 12? Yes, it is. B, 8 plus 6, is that 12? Oh, no, 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 it's not. C, 90,426 minus 90,418. Brother Jason's my regular math buff. We both love math. Math is always our favorite subjects. Is that equal 12? No. So instead of the first slide where we're constantly trying to correct people who are still getting to the same destination, the same answer, we should be more concerned with this slide, making sure that people hear the truth that helps them get to the answer. You see, we're living in a society today where we're being taught that all roads lead to heaven. That's this slide. That's not correct. We're being taught that this idea will get you saved. A man's idea, a belief system, a, a baptismal tank, a priest, a pope, a certain religion. You're a Catholic, you're a Baptist, you're a Methodist, you're a Lutheran. No, that's not correct. We have to find out what God says about it. And we actually need to start caring again what God says. Shame on Representative Nadler last week. 
congressman from New York who said, the will of God is of no concern to this Congress. If that man had read his Bible, he would learn that you better be concerned with the will of God. And America has been blessed as a country because there was many leaders down through the ages that did care about the will of God. Or as I preached before, they actually cared what God thought about things. You see, as missionaries come in this week, we understand that the things they have to do in the Philippines will be different than the things they have to do in New Zealand. will have to be different than the way they reach the deaf. It will be different than the way the United States of America. And I think sometimes we take it for granted because even in this own church here, down through the years, some of you have said, wow, the deaf, they don't seem to really pay attention during music, during song services. And out of respect for you all, I've told them many times, the hearing would appreciate it if you would pay attention to songs. And they go, okay. And guess what happens in the next service? They don't. They chat and talk. It's a different culture. But see, it's easy for us to sit here and say, well, they should be. They can't hear the song. You understand that my 81-year-old dad has never heard his granddaughters and grandsons sing. Never. Never. He's never heard a piano. He's never heard that choir special we just sang a little while ago. Never heard it one time. So be a little easy on him when he doesn't appreciate music like we do. And I think sometimes as Christians, we get so obsessed with that first slide because they can't do it seven plus three. We've always done it two plus eight. It can't be different. We've always done it two plus eight. Seven plus three is still ten. You'll be okay. And we need to be more concerned with this slide. Because it's not all of the above, and it's not C, and it's not B. Well, how do we find the answer? How do we find that balance? I'm going to give you through four points today, and today they're not going to be one, two, three, four like normal. It's going to be A, B, C, D. I'll go ahead and let you guess what D's going to be. What's D? What statement D going to say? Wow, you guys are a smart class today. I love it. You guys are awesome. So the mission verse for the message today, the mission statement, the goal that Jesus wants us to get to is John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him, whosoever means people in New Zealand, Philippines, death, anywhere, believe in him, should not perish but have everlasting life. The Christian life is ultimately about some B's that I'm going to give you today. And number one, it starts with what does the Bible say about it? You see, we, we live in such a, an odd generation now where I was listening to a, a comedian. He's a clean comedian. He's hilarious. He was describing new math because his daughter was being taught new math in the public school system. And how it's offensive to tell a kid if he happens to write down 2 plus 2 equals 5, he doesn't want to offend him. Well, let's teach him a new math way to, to make sure he finally understands. We don't want to offend him. No, no. Here's, here's how you deal with that. Five's the wrong answer. Change it to four and learn it the right way next time. Or you won't get credit for it on your test. And can I tell you something? We have got to get back to finding out what the Bible says about things. What does the Bible say about things? As preachers, as dads, as husbands, as wives, as mothers, as Christians who should be striving to be a blessing in the midst of receiving all the blessings, let's find out what the Bible says. In John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word is with God, and the Word was God. Hey, it's the final authority today, right here, the Word of God. My opinion does not matter. My traditions don't matter. If the Bible says something contrary to my traditions, my tradition is wrong and the Bible is right. What does the Bible say about marriage? What does the Bible say about finances? What does the Bible say about respecting authority? What does the Bible say about morality? What does the Bible say about sin? What does the Bible say about holiness? What does the Bible say about salvation? I said, what does the Bible say about salvation? You see, I grew up in a church where we lived in the second slide, and somebody told me B was my answer, and I was confused, and I left the church frustrated. I even got baptized a few times trying to force 14 into 12. It didn't work out that way. But thank God one day somebody preached the Bible to me and told me what the Bible said and taught me the Bible's authority. And when I found out what the Bible said, I understood salvation for the first time clearly. It doesn't matter that it's 2021. What does the Bible say? It doesn't matter that we have a lot of liberal philosophies out there. What does the Bible say? It doesn't matter that our universities and our school systems are inundated now with heathen teaching and false teaching and dangerous ideology and they're rewriting our history books. It doesn't matter what any of those people say. It does not matter what Hollywood says. It doesn't matter what anybody says today, including the preachers themselves. What does the Bible say, my friend? What does the Bible say? If you have a question about something in life, I would encourage you as a friend, find out what the Bible says about it. 
If you have a struggle going on in your life right now, why don't you find out what the Bible says about it? I got to be careful how I say this, but several years ago I was very frustrated because a deaf person had secured me to interpret. I can say this story because it happened years ago. And they hired me to interpret for them in a counseling situation, and this deaf person was struggling with some things in their life. And look, I, I, I thank God for counselors and people that try to work with these people. Thank God for them. But this particular counselor, for 30 minutes, all he did was ask this deaf lady questions. So, have you tried to hurt yourself, lady? Have you, have you, when have you, have you been suicidal? Da, da, da. And I was, okay. And, and the lady's answering all the questions. I'm interpreting and interpreting, 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 interpreting. After 30 minutes, he goes, okay, here's your medication. Come back and see me in six weeks. So I walked out the front door with this deaf lady, and I said, ma'am, I'm off the uh, clock now. I'm not an interpreter anymore. Can I tell you what I do for a living? She said, yes. I said, I'm a pastor. I gave her a track. She got saved. And not long after that, she came to this church and got baptized. She has since moved away. This is years ago. But can I tell you something? She was doing really well the last time I checked on her. I'm not saying these counselors don't do the right. But listen, I'm telling you, the problem with that situation is this. The counselor never one time wanted to find out what the Bible has to say about it. Well, you got to keep the Bible out of stuff. Yeah, that's our problem, my friend. Thank you. You you just proved the problem in America. Separation of church and state. Thank you. That's the problem in America. And by the way, our founding fathers, when they crafted that statement, never intended for separation of church and state to mean that this church could not be involved with the state. It meant for the state not to be involved with the church. That's what they said. What does the Bible say? I've been preaching this book for a long time, my friend. I've been studying it for a long time. I've learned this. If you live by the Bible, you won't live a perfect life, but it's amazing how things work out better when you live by biblical principles. Can I, can I make a declaration today? The Bible works. The Word of God works. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word is with God, and the Word was God. I'm having problems in this area, preacher. Okay, we want to help you, but let's go find out what the Bible says. Thank God the Bible still speaks loudly today. Unfortunately, many are trying to conceal it and hide it. They think the government has better plans and better ideas. No, sir. No, ma'am. The Bible still works today. The Bible still works. A, to be a Christian, that's a blessing. Is A, the Bible, the right answer? Yes, it is. All right, let's go to B. This is important. Balance is on there. Oh, balance. Oh, okay. See, a lot of times we will only circle A and forget about balancing the Bible in our lives. This is where people take one phrase out of a verse and build a whole doctrine or cult or religion on it and totally disregard every other part of the Bible. It's balanced, my friend. Look with me here real quickly in John chapter 1, verse 14. Jesus became the epitome of balance. Jesus promoted balance. He was a balanced man. The story of his birth, to the story of him being 12 years old, to the story of his activities while on earth, to his crucifixion, and to the resurrection, and to his ascension, and to the teachings he laid out for the disciples, all present a beautiful, biblical balance of living. It's so important to stay balanced, my friend. Here it says in John 1, verse 14, again, verse 1 is the key verse. That's A. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Jump down a few verses. Verse 12, I love that. To them he gave you power to become the sons of God. Hallelujah. Verse 14, and the Word was made flesh, made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. Here it is. Look at this beautiful balance. Full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. All right, go back to the first slide. Brother. Actually, no, no, you can stay here. If you want to get to 12, five can't do it by itself. Five does not equal 12. If you want to get to 12, seven won't do it by itself. Seven does not equal 12. But wait a second. Watch this now. Five and seven make 12. Five, listen, and, and seven make 12. You see, Christianity today has become lopsided. We want all grace but no truth. You're not going to get to 12. We want all truth and no grace. You're not going to get to 12. It's a beautiful balance. You see, Jesus Christ lived that balance beautifully. Watch this now. Jesus Christ, when children were running to him one day, and the disciples had fallen into that pharisaical celebrity trap where he's a somebody and Jesus was a somebody, no doubt. And we have to shoo these kids away. Jesus said, no, 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 stop. Suffer the little children to come unto me. And everybody observing that day would say, wow, 
What a gentle, kind man. What a soft, tender, compassionate man. But in the same Gospels, which, by the way, this story is recorded four times, one day he shows up in the temple, and there's some people selling stuff in the temple. And Jesus said this, oh, no, you didn't. And he went out and made a whip. And he came in and threw the tables over. And he whipped people out of the temple. And people observing that that time would have said, oh, my soul, what a ferocious man who's out of control and has anger. No, no, Jesus was the perfect balance. He was the perfect picture of balance. He knew when grace was necessary and he knew when truth was necessary. He knew when it was time to smile and be compassionate. He knew it was time to stand up and be firm. And Christianity is so lopsided today, the world can't even recognize it anymore. And the world sometimes says, I want to get to 12, but all they see is 5, and they can't get there. I want to get to 12, and all they see is 7, and they can't get there. It's balance. Ephesians 4 makes a statement, one God and Father. 2 Peter 3, verse 18 makes this statement, grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. The Holy Spirit's called the comforter in John and the convictor. What's the significance of that? Watch this now. Balance. As God, he's holy. As God, he's full of wrath. As Father, he sent his son to die on the cross for us. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is. Say it again. Why didn't they put Savior there? Because it's a different verse. It's a different purpose at the time. That's the balance side of Jesus, where as Lord, every knee's going to bow. Every tongue's going to confess. That's the Lord's side. But the Savior side said, today thou will be with me in paradise. The Savior side says, mom, mom, be- woman, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother. That's the Savior side. The Lord's side did clean out the temple. The Savior side suffered the children to come unto me. Wow, what a balance in the Holy Spirit of God. Can I testify today? We don't talk about the Holy Spirit enough in our Baptist churches like we should. It's almost like we're afraid to talk about him because the Pentecostals or Charismatics have a, have a monopoly on him. Let me tell you something today. Blessed be the Holy Spirit of God who indwells me and keeps me. And there's many times he convicts me when I'm doing wrong and he makes me feel bad and he should. That's his job. And as soon as I repent and get right, he comforts me again. What a balance God has today. And in the midst of that Godhead, we need to implement that. Because there's a side of me that needs to be the father who's not afraid to look at my four children and say, no. Then there's a daddy side who says, hey, let's go get some ice cream because you did really good in that basketball game. I got a good grade on that test, and I'm so proud to be your daddy. Balance. We need that desperately in America today. You can still be firm and stand for the truth, but love people while they're doing that. In fact, can I tell you, we preached it a few weeks ago. Love demands truth, and truth needs love. It is the end of the equation. You can't do five and get 12. You can't do seven and get 12. But grace and truth get you, Jesus. The beautiful balance. Number one, or sorry, A, Bible. B, balance. Boy, those are right. Let's go and skip to D, right? No, no, let me just go and give you C anyway because Brother Jason really worked hard on that equation to put up there for C. So let's go back to the first slide. (laughs) First slide. Thank you, Brother Jason. I love it. He's just such a good job up there. All right. Look at at John chapter 8. John chapter 8. One of the keys to true, genuine Christianity And I don't even want to use this phrase, but one of the selling points of Christianity, and I shouldn't even use the word selling point, but you know what I mean when I say that, is you have, you experience true freedom, true liberty. True Christianity is not bound by law, but true Christianity also isn't so much freedom or liberty that you practice what the Bible calls licentiousness. There's a grace movement now that teaches Christians, you can do whatever you want, whatever you want. God still loves you. He will still love you. But if you do whatever you want, you're not going to be happy. You're just not. As a father, I'd be a pitiful father if I told my four kids as they were growing up, kids, I got good news for you. You can do whatever you want. You can sleep whenever you want. You can eat whatever you want. You can watch whatever you want. I don't think my four kids would be in church today loving Jesus like they do. But there's still a balance there. And if you get the Bible right and you get the balance right, you get the blessing right. See his blessing. And the blessing is liberty and freedom. Watch what the Bible says in John chapter 8. Jesus is faced with a lot of harassment at this point in his ministry. Two chapters before, one of only two times that John 666 shows up, or 666, chapter 6, verse 66 shows up in the Bible. Again, I'm on numbers today. It's interesting. You can look it up. John 666, John chapter 6, verse 66. 
says that people left Jesus. They literally abandoned him. Interesting that that verse says that. And then Jesus turns to Peter and says, will you go away also? And Peter makes a beautiful statement or asks a beautiful question. To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of life. Peter made a powerful decision that day. It was statements like that that made Jesus say, Peter, you will preach the day of Pentecost. You have no clue right now, but you are going to preach when I'm ascended and 3,000 people are going to get saved one day. Powerful statement he makes. So now we're in John chapter 8. He's being harassed by religion. He's starting to be questioned by the very masses of people that loved and adored him. And Jesus makes two simple statements in these verses. And I don't have time to read the whole context to you. But in, in context, this is what he's dealing with when he says this. Look at verse 32. And ye shall know the what? Truth. And the truth shall make you what? Wow. Isn't that amazing? So the knowledge, not the truth, but the knowledge of the truth makes you free. All right, jump down to verse 36, same chapter. All right, the Bible says this. If the Son, who's that? Who? Okay, let's be consistent. The Bible does not ever contradict itself. Let's, if we were to back up to John chapter 1 again, he was the Word, and he was the Word that was made what? Flesh, and did what? Dwelt among us. So the Word that was made flesh that dwelt among us says this. If you know the truth, it'll make you free. And then the Bible says this, to complete balance, and gave you the blessing. If the Son therefore shall make you free, if the Son therefore shall make you free, if the Son therefore shall make you free, not religion, not a baptismal tank, not some man's philosophy, not the Pope, not the priest, not a Baptist preacher. If the Son therefore shall make you free, look at this powerful exclamatory statement. He says, ye shall be free indeed. Wow. What a verse. What a profound truth there. What a balance. Which leads to a blessing. I've observed Christianity for a long time now. When I first got in, it was heavy on truth and light on grace. Now, the longer it goes, it seems like we're heavy on grace and light on truth. And I want to remind you as a pastor of this church, I want to try the best I can to answer number D. Let's be all of the above. Let's be all of the above. Because you know why? Five plus five does equal ten. And you know what? Two plus eight does equal ten. In fact, I'm going to add some more. Six plus four equals ten. Seven plus three equals ten. Nine plus one equals ten. Isn't that amazing? Oh, and Brother Jason, 90,428 minus 90,418 equals 10. Ha! All of the above. Christianity needs a genuine revival of proper Bible, married with balance, living to be a blessing to this lost world. First of all, let's start here. Are you a blessing to your own church family? Are you a blessing to your wife or your husband? Are you a blessing to your children? It's amazing that when we live the Bible with balance, we become a blessing in the midst of receiving blessings. And it becomes a beautiful cycle, which hence goes back to our theme for the year, which is what? To give. You want to be effective in the theme to give? Get your Bible right. Stay balanced. Be a blessing. And huh, what do you know? All of the above. Hey, Jesus, I just want to tell you something right now, okay? Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him. We told him, no, stop. But, 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 but we just cast out demons. No, you can't do that. But we use Jesus' name. No, no, no. I just want you to know we did that, Jesus. And Jesus said unto him, forbid him not. For the, he that is not against us is for us. What is Jesus teaching? Listen, you don't have to look far to find out who's against us. So you better keep those that are for you close. And some of them are coming. Some of those heroes are coming to our place this week. Missionaries who are leaving the comforts of America. Genuine heroes who, if LeBron James and Tom Brady get saved and go to heaven someday, won't even hold a candle to the people we're going to have this week. Oh, they won championships and Super Bowls in heaven. They might get a chocolate chip cookie for that. 
But to get real rewards and to get real attention in heaven, you got to be what these people are going to come this week. And they get to share a few days with us. And we get to sit in our pews and soak it in as a young couple stands up and says, I'm going to the Philippines. And as a more middle-aged couple says, we're going to reach the death. And as another young couple says, I'm going to New Zealand. And as we sit here and soak it in and we say, God, help us to be all the above Christians. We want that Bible. We want that balance. We want that blessing. All of the above. All of the above. And in the midst of that cycle, we can reach people for the cause of Christ. And we can see our children carry on what we're teaching them. And our grandchildren. And our great-grandchildren. Until Jesus comes. Because here's the deal. If you answered that question on the test we took back in the day with a number two pencil. Did I already cover the number two pencil? Number two pencil. Isn't it? This, is this a bad testimony when my eraser always ran out before the pencil did? That's a bad sign, isn't it? I'm just saying. Number two pencil. If I would have said I like five plus five and scratch that, it would have been wrong on the test. Because B was right. C was right. Which made D the right answer for that particular question. Church. All of the above. Hedge about eyes are close. Thank you for listening so well. Hello, Pastor Randy Dignan here from Bible Baptist Church in Jefferson City, Missouri. I'm going to take a moment and express to you what our main vision and purpose is of this ministry. You see, much of this world today has a question. It's a question that was asked in John chapter 3 by one person. It's a question that is asked by the masses, but when you really think about it, it's really a question we all have to come to grips with, face to face with, one on one in our lives, sometime in our life. The question is this, where will I spend eternity? And that question was asked by a religious leader by the name of Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He approached Jesus Christ in the middle of the night and had a question about spiritual matters. Well, good thing for Nicodemus. He came to the right person at the right time because Jesus Christ is the answer in spiritual matters. You see, many of us have questions about that. And man has tried in many of its efforts to answer that question with their own ideas and philosophies. We've tried to come up with ideas on how to get us to heaven, how to confirm our way to heaven. But the fact is we got to find out what God says about eternal things. And that's why asking Jesus Christ that question is so vital. Because when you ask Jesus a question, you get the answer. And as the question was asked, Jesus answered simply this. You must be born again. In John chapter 3, that's what he said to Nicodemus. And that's the same thing he says to you and to me even today. You see, God is God of this universe, but he's not everybody's father. What does that have to do with John chapter 3? Well, think about this. We all have birthdays. We all are physically born under this physical planet. Or else you wouldn't be able to watch me or I wouldn't be able to sign to you right now or talk to you at this time. But God, being a spiritual being, knew that though our bodies are temporal, our spiritual part of us, our spiritual anatomy of us, is an eternal thing. And so God says, I'm more concerned about the spiritual issues. And that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you and me 2,000 years ago and live again three days later so that you and I can have a spiritual birthday and know for sure that heaven is our home. Well, that leads to the next question. Why do we need a spiritual birthday? Well, it's simple. We're all sinners. We've all broken God's law and God's commands. But God loves us so much so that he let Jesus Christ become the substitute for your sin and my sin. So that if we recognize and admit that we are sinners, we can then trust in Jesus Christ as our substitute. And more so than that, our personal Savior and know that on top of our physical birthdays, we have a spiritual birthday now in that God becomes our father. We become his sons, daughters. We become his children. And we know we're going to go to heaven someday. My friend, it's very simple. It's not about what the church says, or what I have ideas about, or what you have ideas about. It's finding out what God says directly to you and me. And he did it right there in the Bible. And in particular, John chapter 3, when Jesus says, you must be born again. If our church can help you with that question, if you have any questions about that, we can give you some answers. We'd be glad to help you in any way we can. Again, Pastor Randy, personally thanking you for watching the message. And again, if there's anything we can do for you, let us know. God bless and make it a great day.